If there's one argument in the almost never-ending sub versus dub debate that I feel doesn't quite have the magnitude many say it does, it's the idea that dubs can't be taken seriously because licensors use the same arbitrary number of voice actors for all their projects. Obviously people don't literally stand by those exact numbers, but the general sentiment behind them is that immersion gets broken when we hear the same people give similar performances across multiple shows in a short amount of time. I'm going to tell you the top five most English dub. With way more sword skills on higher floors. The ultimates are working together. Wow, I thought she looked scary before. After all, no matter how talented an actor or group of actors might be, or how positive our initial impressions of them were, it's only natural to react negatively towards things that are excessively exposed to us. Of course, this can give the impression that the English dubbing industry just doesn't take things as seriously as the Japanese anime voiceover market, where casting seemingly can be more varied and extensive comparatively. But with that said, how exactly are English-speaking voice actors selected for anime dubs? Many would argue that the ideal approach to casting an English dub would be through what's called an open audition, where a public post is made for roles that people can compete for. And now, with online submissions, anyone with a good audio setup can theoretically apply. However, there are noticeable factors that contribute to why this practice isn't that common in any sector of voiceover, or acting in general. One of the obvious ones is that this process is the most time-consuming, and for a lot of anime, that potentially means very little return. While opening up the anime audition process to everybody would lead to finding actors who are capable and well-suited for your roles, this would also mean hours upon hours spent sorting through hundreds or even thousands of auditions from people who might not even be qualified at all. There's no shortage of fans who just want to be in their favorite anime without adequate skill, and sacrificing time in an already compressed schedule to sort through all those submissions is less than practical. But when you know of someone who's reliable and already willing to put in the work, they'll probably get cast through what's known as a closed audition. This is where a casting director, ADR director, or producer amasses a specific list of people they want to hear from for any number of reasons, and call them into audition for specific parts, either from their previous work, referrals from other actors, demo reels, agent recommendations, etc, etc. No anime audition will have all the characters available to read, only the most important ones. People may be asked to read for a specific character, or they can choose who to read for, but in the case of the latter, you can read for as many as time allows, unless the director has imposed a limit. Or, if you're submitting a web audition, you can submit for as many characters as you like unless specified otherwise. And sometimes, an actor can take advantage of that if they know enough about a project so as to be cast in a role that they think they'd be best suited for. King Explosion Murder. My Hero Academia is one of the very rare instances of us actually holding auditions for a simul dub. I went into the audition process for that show and I was like, well, there's no way I'm not going to read for Deku. I analyzed the current Funimation talent pool and I said, I'm going to read for Deku, but my gut instinct was Justin Briner would be Deku. And I went, so I'm going to read for it, but I'm going to make my, I'm going to purposefully cater my Bakugo audition to sound good against Justin Briner's voice. Then there are cattle calls, which are basically just mass auditions where a studio or talent coordinator will call up agencies in the area and ask them to send over their top talent to choose from, without specifying certain people. And sometimes, parts of each method will be mixed together in the casting process. There can be times where a director runs auditions for some characters, but already have actors lined up for others through either a separate casting director or even the producers for, in super rare cases, marketing purposes, which is called stunt casting. Generally, this is pretty uncommon for dubs, but sometimes the actors in the industry are treated as celebrities, even if it's just relegated to the anime niche. Of course, casting for the sake of notoriety can serve as a double-edged sword, since no matter how talented you might be, miscast can still hold an actor or even the product as a whole back. Granted, this is by no means exclusive to anime, or even the English side of it for that matter, as Japanese voice actors are arguably being treated like celebrities now more than ever, but that's a topic for a different video entirely. However, nowadays, a lot of anime dubs are precast, which means that a show's ADR director would simply assign an actor a role without auditions based on their previous work, demo reels, and other characters they might have played, so long as they're available. Some people argue that this style of casting has the potential to prevent newer actors from getting involved with particular shows, if a director just sticks with their already established talent pool. 
Time kind of is of the essence in the production timeline, but finding the best voice actor for your character may require more intensive search. As Clifford Chapin just mentioned earlier, this obviously doesn't mesh well with the fast-paced world of simuldubs, as well as the overwhelming fan demand for dubs that don't lag months or even years behind the Japanese release. Sometimes the rate at which projects now have to be done has led to, among other things, actor fatigue, where talent gets burned out on the amount of hours they have to do after being called in for multiple projects. This in turn has resulted in directors getting creative with regards to who they now cast in certain roles, because they know it would be impractical to overwork the same select group of people. There are definitely those who won't think outside the box. However, this was still an issue even when shows were always auditioned, and the main thing that changed now is the way actors are presenting themselves. An actor's demo usually contains their best reads, and gives the opportunity to show off their range so they can be cast off of the optimal version of themselves. But add in this diversity push, and you end up with actors doing parts that they wouldn't have been chosen for in a normal setting. It's easier to justify these against the grain precast decisions without auditions because it gives the director more license to cast as they see fit, and any time saved from casting can be used to better develop the actual dub itself. For the gamers broadcast dub, ADR director Krista McGuire specifically picked talent who she knew were also gamers, because she wanted the show to have that extra layer of authenticity since she wasn't one herself. But regardless of which casting method is used, the presence of a Japanese client in the dubbing process is usually something many fans overlook, and should also be considered when discussing the selection of actors, even when the level of involvement will vary from licensor to licensor. Well, I was told to send in like the top five, and you know, who had the best audition, who most closely represented uh, the character on screen, and the seiyu, and uh, maybe even a tip of the hat to the previous dub, and kind of mix all of those ideas together for the new voice. So then they sent these to uh, Japan, and the recordings to Japan, and Japan decided who was going to be in it. The entire country. Sometimes the dubbing team will be given little to no insight into how a character should be played, aside from what they can glean from whatever Japanese material is already released, while other times the producers will go so far as to approve an English cast and actually sit in on the recording sessions. Plus, if a Japanese client really disapproved of how their properties were being handled for any reason, it's usually subject to change, as maintaining a positive relationship with them is incredibly important to Western distributors. So for the sake of putting things into perspective, let's examine a hypothetical situation for a brand new studio. You've just created an anime distribution company with an in-house recording studio somewhere that's not within driving distance of any of the states where dubbing is currently done. You decide to base it there because that's where your family lives, and therefore didn't want to relocate to be near California, Texas, or New York. You just spent most of your new company's capital on buying your first anime, along with the rights to air it on American television and release on home video with a brand new English dub which is a broadcast requirement. But, because of where you chose to build your studio, there's probably no voice actors nearby with any anime experience whatsoever. Flying in voice actors from the popular dubbing states won't work because you literally just spent thousands upon thousands of dollars buying your anime. So your budget for the dub part of production isn't huge, and actors won't be willing to fly in on their own dime because they have no idea who your company is and whether or not this project will even get finished properly. You also can't afford to outsource your dub to a recording studio in one of those dubbing states because that's outside your budget too. So how do you find new actors? Well, you'd scout the local theater scene. You see a few plays and approach actors after the show who you think have unique voices or would fit the characters for your first anime. Some may decline because the pay for anime work isn't worth taking time out of their busy theater schedules, while others may still decline if the show you've licensed happens to conflict with their morals, especially if you bought an ecchi show on the cheaper end of the spectrum to get the ball rolling for your company. This is something that working anime voice actors have come to accept as part of their business, but theater actors may be completely blindsided by. Still, some may agree to come into your studio to record with you, so now you need to teach ADR to those who are completely new to voiceover work. Some of your new recruits will only need a couple of hours of paid training and get the hang of this, but others may never be good at it, no matter how hard you try and how much money you waste on either trying to teach them or getting their recording engineer to save their performances. In the end, you thankfully managed to scrap together a cast and get the show recorded. You release the show and despite it being a little rough, dub fans are excited to hear a show coming from a new studio. Now, after sending the Japanese client their cut, you have the profits from show number one in hand which you can use to buy and cast show number two. So who do you cast? Your studio still isn't big enough to be noticed by actors in other states, so more likely than not you're going to hire actors from show number one who prove that they're good at ADR and are willing to continue doing anime work. So you check out the theater scene again to find new talent, but your stable of actors have already proven themselves to be good, and even if you did go to see some plays, you'd probably just run into all your old talent if the theater scene in your town isn't very big. So you go with your proven set of actors. 
Until your studio gets enough traction, actors won't be coming to your state specifically to work with you. Not until you've had enough shows to maintain a healthy actor ecosystem. A company like Funimation can do this now because they're pumping out over 60 to 80 shows per year thanks to their simuldub initiative. With enough roles to go around, actors can afford to move to Texas specifically in hopes of working mostly with Funimation as their bread and butter, while doing other acting gigs in the state at other studios on the side. But if our hypothetical company is only doing one or even a handful of shows per season, and there's no other related work to be had in your state, you simply can't offer actors enough incentive to stick around and be ready to hire at a moment's notice. Once your company gets big though, you can afford to fly in actors from other states, but your old stable of actors still expect work from you, and fans might expect to still hear them. Your studio's quote-unquote sound has been established at this point, and shows released with all new actors and none of the recognizable favorites may not always perform as well with fans of your studio. So until your company has shows large enough to contain both new actors and old favorites, you're probably just going to ignore the vocal minority. After all, those who hate hearing the same actors over and over again aren't the loyal fans who keep your experienced actors or company's wallet happy. And if you think this all sounds a little far-fetched, it's actually not too far off from how Funimation, a company slapped in the middle of Texas, started off. I was doing a lot of theater in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and a friend of mine I made in the theater named Michelle Irving was actually friends with Chris Sabat, and Chris Sabat was holding the auditions. When we were casting Dragon Ball Z, we didn't have a large actor pool at the beginning. I think, I think there were 11 people on our cast list from that first year. There were like 11 people is all we could find that were willing to work for the rates that Funimation was willing to pay at that time. I don't think that Funimation knew what they were getting when they came here to Texas. I think they thought, okay, well, this is a good place to record. First of all, you have to do with unions, and, you know, it's, it's rent is a lot cheaper here, you know? So it's like, this is a really good place to have a production company. If you paid actors a ton of money per hour to dub anime, Funimation would have been broke before they finished one episode. But it was a crazy place. We started out in a bank building, and we were actually just in one corner of the second floor of this bank building. We had one booth, and then it branched out to two booths, then three booths, and then eventually it became a new space that's the size of a football stadium, which is what we're in right now. As you can see, everything happens for a reason, but rarely is laziness the only reason. So let's talk a bit about ADR, or Automated Dialogue Replacement, the process of meticulously inserting dialogue in a piece of media with pre-existing visuals line by line. While it is true that staff at dubbing companies receive daily submissions of demo reels, short one-minute audio files showing off an actor's skills, assuming that anyone can suddenly become an anime actor often underestimates the huge learning curve that goes into adapting to ADR. There are many English-speaking voice actors who have worked extensively in anime ADR as well as prelay, ranging from TV shows to video games, and almost all these actors admit that anime ADR, despite not being as lucrative, is the most technically challenging form of voiceover work bar none. Not only do you have to act, but you need to do it within the confines of the character's seemingly arbitrary lip flaps on screen. The goalposts are constantly moving as the director and recording engineer edit and tweak every single line that doesn't fit properly while actors stand in a booth trying to get through the script. In prelay animation or video games, you act into a void and the visuals are mostly produced around your voice for you. In abridged content, actors submit their audio individually and lip flaps are manually edited to sync to that, something that would never happen for an official uncut production. Anime ADR can be super frustrating, hard to teach, and due to tight scheduling, in some cases there's the concern that the project will be held back if too much time and money is spent on trying to support a newer actor. Stupid, selfish adult. But again, considering the low pay of anime roles in the US, it isn't always easy or practical to constantly fly to wherever work might be, because it might not even be worth the journey. It's possible, but it can't always be relied upon, and financially it's more realistic to settle in one state. Nowadays, we have a process known as Source Connect, where you have a person in a video call, but you're also using a computer to record and send audio over in real time. However, the technology is still in its relative infancy, isn't widely applied, and even when it is, doesn't always yield the most profitable returns. The more locations you record anime in, the more engineers you'd need to pay, since mixing and editing an actor's vocals into the timeline needs to be done on the spot. And that's assuming the equipment used, as well as the recording environment of everyone involved, is even the same. Audio inconsistencies can come off as jarring no matter how good of a performance someone gives, so sometimes casting based on location in order to keep everything uniform is just the sensible thing to do. But nowadays, management between companies has thankfully improved, and most anime dubbing studios are using more of the same recording equipment, as there are many benefits that come with that sense of uniformity. 
For example, Okatron 5000, which currently handles all things Dragon Ball, is owned by Christopher Sabat, a veteran actor who began work with Funimation early in the company's life. Studios like this use similar recording equipment to Funimation and Bang Zoom, including Neumann microphones, which are industry standard and circumvent a lot of those sound inconsistencies we had prior with cross-country recording. Just last year, Chris was able to make a cameo in the dub for One Punch Man without having to travel all the way over to LA where the dub was recorded. Who are you? Just a guy who's a hero for fun. And thanks to places like Central Command Studio, more Funimation dubs were able to utilize the LA talent pool, without actors always needing to fly down to Texas. Casting is a creative process unto itself, and even though there are those willing to take the easy way out, there are also those doing whatever it takes to cast the best people possible given the circumstances. Granted, this is far from a recent phenomena. The original Fullmetal Alchemist was a Texas dub from 2004 with cast members from New York and Canada, the Helsing dub had British-accented actors who were stationed in the U.S., and even Black Lagoon had first-timer Dean Redman as one of their leads. Amen. Hallelujah and peanut butter. Back then, these examples were almost the exception before they were the rule. But nowadays, despite things being trickier than they ever have been before, there are plenty of standout examples that are being released more frequently in recent years, which shows that extra effort continues to be made. We have people like Michael Center Nicholas, whose recording studio, NYAV Post, continues to make the most of its two branches across the United States, one in New York and one in LA. This way, the team has a wider net of actors to choose from for their projects, and when observing their output, including actual children playing younger characters, or even recently with their inclusion of a deaf-accented actress for a silent voice's titular character, it becomes increasingly clear how good casting can really make a difference to fans. Just last year, we had Sound Cadence Studios bring together a ridiculously diverse cast across America and even Canada for the real Rainbow Gate dub, that director Amber Lee Connors cast as an outsourced job for Media Blasters. This year, we've had shows like Gossip, where there were less obstacles that prevented Clifford Chapin, an ADR director over at Funimation, from filling the main cast with actors who were stationed all across the United States because he legitimately believed those people were the best for the job. In just this season, broadcast dubs like Garl Vanishing Line are making use of LA talent despite the tighter production schedule. Now granted, a lot would have to change before we could ever get to that stage where this is considered the norm, but to paraphrase Mr. Sinter Nicholas himself, actors are a director's palette. The latter can only do their job effectively if they have the most appropriate talent available. And even though the presence of newer actors doesn't necessarily mean that casting overall will improve, we'll never have the chance to test that unless the industry continues to grow. With that said, I don't think we'll ever stop noticing regular actors like Alexis Tipton, Christopher Sabat, and Erica Mendez popping up in show after show, because they're experienced actors who already have the skills they need to do the job of dubbing efficiently. Overall, the biggest obstacle for diversifying talent in shows are still time, location, and budget. There are more anime being produced overall, and as a result, the demand for dubs of them increases proportionally. When dubbing an anime over the internet, the feedback loop can sometimes take too long to do anything efficiently. There's also a large cost increase compared to using a local actor. There isn't always the money to fly actors and put them up either, especially with simuldubs where actors need to come in and record every week. At that point, in most cases, you'd ostensibly be hemorrhaging money. But at the same time, these constraints have arguably created more opportunities for newcomers to thrive because those same veterans are branching out and trying new things themselves, with some even stepping into directing roles and giving those new actors a shot. Many don't notice it right away, but the number of people working in the industry as a whole has risen exponentially with more experienced actors taking a chance and properly teaching newcomers about the overly technical world of ADR, whether it be in the booth or through their own personally run classes. This is a privilege that was rare during some earlier periods of anime dubs where most of those veterans had to ostensibly learn the ADR process themselves in high pressure environments. In fact, going just off of publicly available credits, over 100 new voice actors have been added to the Texas and LA stables in the past two years. Then again, a lot of people weren't necessarily aware of Justin Briner until he landed the role of Deku in My Hero Academia in 2016, despite the fact that he had several years worth of roles under his belt with Funimation, and he's far from alone in his experiences. Clifford Chapin, Austin Tyndall, Sarah Wiedenhaff, Dallas Reed, Bryn April, and so many more have been around far longer than people might have initially thought. To paraphrase what many anime voice actors have said on this topic, new actors aren't always new. Sometimes, they're just new to you. The problem is that sometimes when you listen to a show and don't recognize an actor immediately, it's easy to glaze over them, not even checking if it's a veteran you don't recognize or a new actor on the scene. Such a hunk! And boy, does he look good in that tight little uniform! I 
I hope Kenshiro gives him a hard fight. Then I might get to see him loosen his tie. Oh, I should have brought a camera today. Now I bet you thought that was Monica Rial. Trust me, you weren't the only one. But no, that was actually one of Marissa Lenti's first large reoccurring roles at Funimation, and one of the first times she gave that kind of performance. Aaron Dismuke, the ADR director, cast her to perform both the high and low voices for the character, despite her natural voice being rather deep. But many dub watchers who simply aren't listening for new actors assume that the role must have been played by an actress who's already proven herself to be a well-loved staple of certain types of characters. It's not uncommon for new dub actors to go unnoticed by audiences until three or four years into their career. And after that point is when people see them as overused actors, thus causing the cycle to begin anew, constantly facilitating the same argument that every English dub has been cast the same way and has been using the same people for the past two decades. Despite what some fans nowadays think, it feels like their issue with how voice actors are selected for anime are more so based on the casting choices made rather than the actual quantity of actors. A lot of us probably dream of an industry where dubs aren't compromised by timing or financial limitations. Dubs where you can't tell what studio they were produced at just by the cast list. But the history of how and why people are cast in anime dubs is evident of just how much circumstances have changed for both the industry at large as well as those who consume its media. Even though everything is far from perfect now, that doesn't mean it's completely static. And hopefully things won't be slowing down anytime soon. So what do you guys think? When it comes to voice acting in anime dubs, do you prefer to hear more newcomers, or would you rather stick to the old favorites? Are there any up-and-comers who you want to hear more of, or are there any actors you've heard a million times and still love to hear? Leave your answers down below so we can keep this conversation going. Be sure to subscribe for more content like this, follow us all on social media, and until next time.